Um, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me again and uh, listening to me. Some of you might have um, heard my presentation on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so I might repeat some things and I might go into one of the or two of the examples that I talked about earlier. The uh, first, let me just address uh, one of the issues, one of the questions that was raised about being sanctioned. Uh, and the tension between prosecution and uh, the defense or the defense and the, and the courts. I have been sanctioned on several occasions, both in, in the United States and before the international courts as a defense lawyer trying to do my job. Uh, so I do not see that as an impediment. In fact, I think that unless you are, you come close to being sanctioned because you're trying to, because you're fighting for your client's rights. Uh, unless you come up to that line, uh, maybe you haven't done all you can possibly do to represent uh, your client. So I don't see that as a problem. Uh, what I would caution is that you have to be extremely ethical when you're a defense lawyer, because the uh, there seems to be uh, a difference between how defense lawyers who are uh, advocating for their clients are treated versus how the prosecution may be treated. The police and the prosecution can do all sorts of things, abuse people's rights and what have you, and rarely will they be punished, uh, whereas a defense lawyer uh, will. Now, getting to the lecture of today, the importance of legal aid in promoting equitable uh, access to justice. So when I looked at this uh, at this title, uh, I, I broke it down and I start and I start backwards with justice. So what are we talking about? We're talking about you know uh, basically the rule of law and, and its application. Everyone treated equally before the law, which means that when you go to court, you should be treated. You know, uh, if your client is uh, is poor, he has the same rights and should be treated just as well as somebody who is rich. Um, the uh, suspects and accused have to be treated humanely. The, uh, the court process has to be fair. And at the end of the day, you want substantive justice as well as procedural justice. And both the substantive justice and the procedural justice in part depend on the system that is applicable, the laws uh, that are, you know, the statutory laws and, you know, uh, the criminal code, for instance, and then the criminal procedure. Then I go back and say, okay, now access to justice. Access to justice meaning actually being able to enjoy these rights. What rights are we talking about? Well, we're talking about what are commonly referred to as fair trial rights. And, you know, I think even in places like China and elsewhere, uh, I would say the world over, you have the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, you have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, you have uh, the United Nations Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhumane, degrading treatments of punishment. Those rights apply to everyone. And so the question is, uh, how, how can you have access to justice to make sure that your rights, your right to a fair trial, to be presumed innocent, to an independent and impartial uh, tribunal, uh, to a public hearing, you know, if, if, the, if the case warrants, uh, to be tried within a reasonable amount of time, so you're not in jail for years and years and years, to be informed of the charges, to have adequate time and facilities, uh, that is, uh, uh, resources to prepare a defense, uh, to defend yourself or to have somebody def you know, defend you, to uh, be able to question witnesses, uh, the right against self-incrimination, uh, uh, the right to an appeal, the right not to be tried after you have been uh, acquitted at the final stage, and of course, provisional release. That is a, uh, also a right, and I would say even a right to be compensated if you're wrongly uh, arrested, tried, or convicted. So how do you get, how do you have access to all of that? And uh, so then if we look at this, uh, the title again, it says, uh, it talks about equitable access. 
And when I think about, when I hear equitable, it means how realistic, because it's one thing to have rights on the books, you know, in the statutes, and it's another thing to be able to enjoy them. And this is where legal aid, I think, plays an enormous amount of uh, importance uh, in equal access. Why is that? Well, if you're rich and powerful, at least in the West, uh, you're going to be able to get a lawyer immediately. They're going to be able to intervene because of the resources that they have. They will be able to investigate. They may have a different kind of rapport with the prosecution. They may get access to the documents, you know, relatively soon. They may be able to uh, to affect on whether charges will be brought or not brought, in part because they're able to move quickly on behalf of the client. Uh, so if, a, if you're, if, if you're uh, indigent, if you're poor, you don't have uh, that, you know, those resources available. And that's where legal aid comes into play. So for instance, in my jurisdiction in, in Alaska, and it, this is pretty much more or less all over the United States, if you are arrested, if you're arrested and you're taken down to the police station, they, you know, you are entitled to make a phone call. You're entitled to make a phone call. Now you say, well, you can call your father or mother, you know, or a friend or relative to maybe get a lawyer to come, uh, come get you, uh, to, uh, to assist you, or you can make a phone call to the public defender agency, the legal aid. You know, uh, when I was uh, working uh, for the public defender agency for the state and the federal, we were on 24 hour call. You know, you, you know if you were the duty counsel, you had a, you know, you were, had a beeper and three o'clock, four o'clock, two o'clock, they will just call you from the jail and say, hey, I'm arrested, what should I do? Uh, that's access to justice, why? Because at that point, I could say, whatever you do, do not talk. Do not uh, just exercise your right, inform the police uh, or, yeah, because usually at that point, it's the police that's doing the, the questioning, uh, that you're exercising your right to remain silent. And that's the end of the story. Then they will not uh, and cannot uh, question you. And if they do, if they persist, then there are mechanisms later on that you can uh, you you can file a motion for the, the statement to be thrown out. So the fact that somebody can immediately, not seventy two hours later after the uh, uh, the police have uh, uh, you know has had an opportunity to question you hours, hours, hours where, as I understand it, in some countries, and I think this is how it is in Japan, they have shifts. It's like that in Korea as well, where after 12 hours, the detective leaves and another detective, fresh one comes in and continues questioning. Well, anybody under those circumstances is gonna say uh, pretty much whatever it is that they need to say uh, in order to get out of that situation. If not, and even if they don't confess, they're more likely to make mistakes because they don't have, uh, you know, it's easy to uh, misunderstand a question. It's easy to contradict yourself when you're tired. And when the police are going, uh, going over the questions over and over again for hours on end, essentially it's a form of torture. Let's, I mean, let's call it for what it is. And, um, and normally th those confessions are, are not necessarily acceptable, at least in many of the jurisdictions. Uh, I can give you a little uh, a story of a case that I had, you know, just to let you know how things go under those circumstances where somebody is arrested and or is being brought in for questioning. So they're not even, uh, they're not even an accused at the point, they're a suspect. So they bring in the suspect and um, it's an illegal fishing. They, they've heard that while this person was commercial fishing, the big commercial uh, vessel, uh, he had shot and killed 
uh, in a bald eagle, you know, one of these birds that is, you know, uh, at least in Alaska, it's considered uh, a very important uh, bird. Uh, you can go to jail for a significant amount of time. So they brought him in. He was about, he was ready to go out fishing. So his entire boat was full of bait, you know, and uh, he was ready to go out. And of course, they confisc they arrest him, they confiscate his boat uh, because th the crime supposedly occurred while he was on the boat. So they confiscated the boat. And what he had in mind was he needed to get out there before the bait spoiled and he lost thousands of dollars and, uh, and then of course not being able to go out and, and fish. So after being in there for several hours and after a promise was made to him that if he admitted to have shot the bald eagle, they would release him you know, thinking that, okay, I'll just say I did it and then I can go out and fish and then I'll deal with it later on. Well, he admitted it. And of course they didn't release him. He was promptly arrested and uh, his boat was confiscated. The, uh, the bait what went was spoiled and eventually he was acquitted uh, at trial. Uh, but this is an example where uh, had that individual this was in federal court. And at the time, I don't know why, uh, he didn't have the presence of mind to uh, make a phone call to ask for a lawyer because they gave him the opportunity uh, to make a phone call. Uh, but here's a good example where if you, have, if you have quick access to a lawyer, uh, that you, be, you, you will be able to get some advice. Now, a lot of times the, process, the, the police will zero in on somebody and they will not declare them a suspect. So they wanna question them as a witness. As a witness, you don't have the same rights that you do as a suspect. If you are a suspect, you have a right to remain silent and they have to warn you. They have to actually tell you that you have this right that you have a right to remain silent. Anything that you say can and will be used against you. So if you begin talking, and a lot of accused begin talking because they think, well, you know, uh, the police is telling him, well, if you tell us right now, we can maybe clear this thing up. Why get the lawyers involved and so on and so forth. And so they end up talking and in the process, uh, maybe contradict themselves or in any event, they don't make their case any better by talking. And so one of the things I usually do when I train lawyers uh, and or when I'm lecturing, uh, I usually say, you have a right to remain silent, exercise it. It doesn't matter how innocent you are, exercise that right, let the lawyer get in. And that's where legal aid comes in. Now, the... Uh, Having access to a legal aid lawyer uh, is important, but only if that legal aid lawyer is actually trained. And so where I practiced, you know, uh, when somebody started, they were either doing very small cases, misdemeanor cases, you know, where their sentence was up to one year, juvenile cases, or they were working on appeals where they could take their time and they're, at, they're basically dealing with legal issues. As they progressed and they got more and more experience, you would work with another lawyer and you would get, you know, you would work on heavier cases, more complicated cases. So it would take you several years before you could do a very serious case. Uh, and why is that? Because uh, at least in the, in the, in, in an adversarial system, which is the parties have their own cases and they're driving the process and the judge is acting more as a referee, it's very, very dynamic. And so you need to have experienced lawyers who know 
uh, how to behave in court, how to conduct themselves in court, but also how to prepare a case uh, for trial. And uh, it takes a lot of experience because you also may be required to use experts. So you need to know, you know which experts to use, how and how to prepare with the experts and how to use them. Uh, and so there's a, there is a whole host of things that uh, you will need to know, which is why in many of the public defender or legal aid offices, there's actually a training program. So uh, when, when, a, when the fresh lawyers come in and usually they hire around the beginning of the year or, or I'm sorry about September, October, we would hire at least, uh, you have a training program that you go through where you learn all the, you know, the things that you need to know, the basic stuff. Uh, trial advocacy is, is very big, of course. Uh, and then also you may have a mentor, somebody who, who you can go to and talk to. And, and, and also there's a training director. Uh, I was a, a co-training director for 55 lawyers for the whole state. People would call me, lawyers would call me from the agency and they had a question or they wanted to discuss the case or brainstorm the case. And so uh, I was able to provide them with, with, uh, with information that would assist them. Same thing with if I was in a complicated case and legal issues would come up because the legal aid system at least in the United States, is, re is representing about 90% of all the cases, I would say. Uh, they're highly specialized. So I could go to the appeals section uh, and who knows the law better than these lawyers because they're dealing with it all the time. And of course, I wanna make sure that whatever I do at trial uh, will assist the appeal lawyers later on if the case is lost. And so I would consult with them and, and say, well, okay, here's this, this legal issue. Am I making the right argument? Should I say something else uh, in order to set it up? Because you know everyone should understand that no matter how good you are, you're gonna lose the case. And, I'm, and, and if you're in a civil law system, even if you win the case, you might, be, you might face an appeal process. But everything that we do as lawyers in court, everything that we do is uh, in meeting the challenges on the, appell on the appellate level. So you actually have to set it up. Uh, if you were in a, if you were in a, uh, in an adversarial process where you have to make a record, you have to actually object in court to make your record. Uh, if you don't make it, the point is waived. And so if you have these, these rights, these fair trial rights, but if you have a lawyer who doesn't protect you and doesn't fight for your rights, doesn't fight for you to, to have adequate time to question the witness in order to get certain points out, doesn't have the time or the resources to do some investigation, uh, or doesn't have the, uh, the experience to understand that uh, he is, that the case is, is way too complicated for him or her and that somebody else, unless uh, these rights are actually afforded, uh, then you don't, you're not getting equitable access to justice. And so uh, when we're talking about legal aid, uh, legal aid plays uh, in my opinion, uh, the most fundamental, uh, how should I put it, function in the criminal justice system. They are just as important as the prosecution, just as important as the police or the judges is the legal aid lawyers. And as I was indicating earlier, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, when you get that one phone call from the police station, you can, you can call legal aid. You can call the duty council and say, hey, uh, I've been arrested, I'm here, what should I do? Uh, and normally the procedure is you're gonna be brought to court and you know, 
there are times I, I, I can recall where the judge is, uh, it's the initial hearing where they're gonna inform you of the charges because that's one of your fair trial rights to be informed in the language, you know, that you understand uh, what the charges are. And so the judge would say, okay, here, these are the charges. Now, uh, do you have a lawyer? If the client, you know, if the accused said, no, I don't have a lawyer. The judge would say, well, I'm not gonna ex ask you for uh, how you plead. I'm just gonna enter automatically. I'm gonna enter a plea of not guilty. And then, you know, if you're gonna go with a private lawyer, fine. Otherwise, for right now, I'm going to assign a, uh, a legal aid lawyer and, until you figure out who you want representing you. And sometimes I would be in court where a situation like this would occur and the judge would say, Mr. Carnavas, uh, since you're here, why don't you sp speak with this gentleman and give him some advice right now? Uh, and so I would speak with the person. Uh, basically, I would then say, well, your honor is entering a plea of, of not guilty. And, uh, and why is that important? Because otherwise, the accused could very well think, well, you know, if I plead guilty, I can get out and what have you. Uh, once you plead guilty, it's very difficult to withdraw. So, but here's the importance of having that legal aid built into the system. And it's not just that. I mean, I think it's, it requires a, a, a mindset it requires a mindset uh, within the system that legal aid is a vital uh, member of the criminal justice chain in a sense that uh, they're just as important as the prosecution because you want to have a strong defense. You wanna make sure that if somebody is convicted, they're convicted based on the evidence and, and uh, after there has been substantive and procedural uh, justice. And it doesn't matter how guilty the person is, they're entitled to a defense, they're entitled to have their rights protected. And uh, the system only works if you have a strong defense, challenging a strong prosecution and ensuring also that the judge is fair and impartial. And I think that's where the legal aid comes in. As far as the 10% who are gonna go with the private lawyers, well, the private lawyers normally have the, you know, they're gonna get paid. They have funds for investigating and what have you. But, you know, we're talking of a minority. The majority of the people, the world over, depends on legal aid. And the quicker, the quicker the lawyer can get to the suspect, to the police station before the interrogation begins, before the beatings begin, before the bullying begins, uh, the better. So I think uh, my time is up. And uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please fire away. <laughs>